Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Saturday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with a look at your forecast around all of Alaska. It's the 22nd of February. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date the way you like to do it, uh, whether that's on the radio from the National Weather Service, NOAA Weather Radio, or online, arh.noaa.gov or weather.gov slash Alaska. Or if you go to weather.gov and simply click on Alaska, it'll take you even in further uh, to the Fairbanks, the Anchorage, or the Juneau National Weather Service office. Give us a call on the phone, 800-472-0391. And while you're punching in the numbers on your phone to uh, get to your forecast area that you want to listen about, uh, write those numbers down, and next time you can do it a little bit faster if you save those numbers that you use there. You can find your weather forecast on Twitter, on U.S. National Weather Service Alaska, and on YouTube. During the afternoon, if you go to NWS Anchorage's account, uh, you can get a brief afternoon forecast about uh, 3.45, 4 o'clock in the afternoon or so, and you'll see all the surface maps that you like to see on this show. And then after the show, in the evening hours, you can get the complete broadcast, the one that you're watching right now, on alaskapublic.org. On the right-hand side of their webpage, you'll see the video player there. Or go to YouTube, and in the search bar, type in AKWX-TV. That's the Alaska Weather Channel's channel on YouTube, and you can find all of the broadcasts there. If you want to go watch your favorite one from six months ago, or you want to watch the one you're seeing tonight, you can certainly do that, especially if you come in late uh, from the boat. Here's a look at what's going on across Alaska. We go up to the Arctic coast. And we're dealing with wind chills once again. Wind chill values there could drop as low as 55 below across some areas of the Beaufort Sea Coast and out toward Barrow. Uh, that's going to go until uh, for the Barrow area, uh, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. Again, for wind chill values, that could drop to 55 below. Now, for a little bit further eastward, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse regions, we're going to let that go until about 5 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. So again, some dangerous wind chills in that region, 50 to 55 below possible in those areas. Now look at the west coast all the way from Constantine Sound, the Seward Peninsula, and Norton Sound out toward, toward St. Lawrence Island. Let's start with the very light pink colors there. That is the dreaded frozen precipitation. That in this case means freezing rain. We're mostly looking at areas that are going to see less than a tenth of an inch of uh, freezing rain possibilities. That's probably going to be mixed with snow in some cases. Some areas around the Nulato Hills will be looking at uh, several inches of accumulation uh, possible with that. So it, it is going to mix, uh, but for many areas there, we're probably talking about uh, freezing rain under a tenth of an inch. So anything more than that, that's when it starts to get into uh, the power line issue. Uh, so if you've got some lines strung up between the houses there, uh, probably could start to see some sagging there if it goes over a tenth of an inch. That's not what we're looking at at this point. As we get out around the Seward Peninsula and the far western sections around uh, Tin City, all the way out toward uh, St. Lawrence Island, uh, we are under a blizzard warning in that area. Some strong winds expected, of course, with uh, accumulating snow, uh, probably on the order of four to six inches in some cases, uh, gusts up to 60 miles an hour possible uh, for the western areas there, all the way out toward uh, Gamble and Savunga. That'll go until six o'clock Sunday morning, so it's mainly a nighttime event into early tomorrow morning. Now around the Norton Sound area, including the southern uh, coastline of the Seward Peninsula and Nome, all the way down toward Hooper Bay, uh, winter weather advisory uh, is in effect there. Uh, with that, we are expecting three to five inches of snow, and like I said, uh, some snow around the Nulato Hills. Uh, that's going to go until six o'clock Sunday morning, and gusts there up to about 50 miles per hour. So a lot of wind moving through the Bering Strait uh, communities, Kotzebue Sound, Norton Sound, St. Lawrence Island, and across the Arctic coast, only the Arctic coast isn't dealing with any precipitation falling at this point. Why is this happening? Well, we've got a pretty strong surge of southerly wind wor working up the western coast of Alaska. You can see the general circulation here, the upper level low, uh, working its way back toward eastern parts of Russia at this point. Underneath that, we've got colder air coming in on the back and west side of that, uh, but we also have some ridging taking place here across the central bearing. And underneath that, there's a much more drier air uh, working into the region. Now, this corridor of very wet air is pretty narrow, really, when you look at it on the map here across all of Alaska. Two things to point out before we push the go button on the loop. 
you'll notice a lot of low gray kind of uh, colors here across southeast, across south central, and the interior. Most of this is not even cloud cover. It's just colder air showing up on the satellite picture. So really what we're concerned about is this part here. This is the moisture and the lift, and this is actual cloud cover, and uh, in some cases precipitation closer to the coast. Now watch what happens. You can see all that moisture is really kind of hugging right over from Kodiak out toward Kotzebue, the Chukchi Sea Coast, and then ending right around St. Paul and the eastern parts of the Aleutians. Southeast is dry, the interior is dry, south central is dry, beautiful days in all those places, but the active weather is going to stay on the west coast. So watch the loop one more time, and you can see how that loop really, or the, the band of moisture really doesn't change too much west or east. It's going to stay that way as we go through the rest of the weekend. Here's a look at the surface map, 962 millibar low north and east of Shemya and uh, north of Adak and Atka. A low pressure system south of Sand Point, southwest of Kodiak at 989 millibars. We've got our cold, dry air sitting right across the north and eastern Gulf with low pressure attached to that across the Pacific Northwest. Cold and dry high pressure across the interior and over the Yukon. We've got some low cloud cover across south central and parts of southwestern Alaska, but really most of the action again right here across the Alaska Peninsula, the YK Delta up to the Seward Peninsula and the Chukchi Sea Coast and Kotzebue Sound where snow was falling this afternoon. Freezing rain will be possible in all those areas. I highlighted that over the snow chances in most of the areas simply because of the warnings and advisories that we have out there. It, there may be some snow mixed in with that, but the primary concern with that, you know what to do with the snow. It's the freezing rain that'll get you. Uh, across the YK Delta, rain across uh, most of the coastal areas there out toward Nunavak Island. And again, some of that could be mixing with snow and freezing rain at times. Across the YK Delta, a chance for rain and snow and across Kodiak. I live to learn with the rain and snow over the next couple days. It does not look like you'll see a whole lot of accumulation, but uh, you're going to be right there on that edge between uh, frozen and liquid precipitation. Now for the interior, for south central, for southeast, uh, we'll say clear dry weather, but maybe not necessarily calm with high pressure in this uh, position. It's going to make for a pretty blustery day across southeast and night for that matter. Some strong winds are possible as we go through the next 24 hours, especially in those gap areas for southeast. So. The sky may be pretty clear. You may not have to deal with a whole lot of fog, but you are going to probably have to listen to the windows rattle from time to time. There may be a few areas of patchy fog across some of the lower spots, but once again, the really active weather is going to be across the west with freezing rain continuing across parts of the Seward Peninsula and the YK Delta tomorrow. Bristol Bay could be looking at some rain, but rain and snow still over south central. We may see some uh, snow falling across the extreme western and southern parts of the Alaska Range, but uh, by and large, it looks like VFR flying through most of Alaska tomorrow, especially the main passes. Now out to the west, you've got a frontal boundary working across the bearing. Well, there'll be a hodgepodge of uh, scattered precipitation across the Aleutians. Uh, may even be some snow out across uh, Attu and Kiska, but after that, it pretty much turns back to rain as you head to the east. Low pressure across the southern gulf there trying to bring in some slightly warmer air across the south. You can see it really doesn't work its way northward at all. It has to kind of work its way eastward before it can uh, move any which direction. By late Monday we may start to see a chance for some snow showers across the southern parts of the uh, Kenai Peninsula. Really doesn't look like we'll see any uh, great accumulation at this point, but maybe some snow showers there as we get into Monday. By and large, though, all of South Central, the Copper River Basin, Southeast remains clear but breezy as you would expect. The interior looks pretty nice and dry. Uh, that main moisture corridor is limited to uh, mostly right over Kodiak Island, the southwestern coast, and even starts to bend away from the Seward Peninsula somewhat over the Bering Strait. With well, a frontal boundary located over the Brooks Range, uh, we'll probably start to see some flurries across the Chukchi Sea Coast, but even areas around the Beaufort Sea Coast still look to be pretty dry as another surge of colder air starts to develop just off the Kamchatka Peninsula and works its way eastward. So we should be in this pattern well into uh, mid parts of next week with some subtle variations to go. Uh, this is kind of how it looks to be for the next uh, couple days. Here's a look at temperatures now across southeast, low to mid 30s across a good part of the uh, southeastern panhandle there, uh, 36 degrees as you get out toward uh, Petersburg and uh, temperatures a little bit farther south down around Ketchikan and Annette. 34 in Juneau, 26 around Haines and in the Skagway area. Uh, Prince William Sound, mid to upper 30s there for the Cook Inlet. Temps were in the low to mid 20s for the most part around Homer and Seward. It was a much milder day for you around Kodiak as well, lower 40s there. Around Glen Allen, two below. Talkeetna was 25. And as you get up across the Alaska Range, uh, areas around the Tanana Valley, including Fairbanks, were in the single digits and low teens. Fairbanks uh, actually at 12. Fort Yukon 11 below, 15 below at Arctic Village. The Arctic Coast anywhere from 15 to about uh, 25 below. Uh, 
Uh, as you get out around the Seward Peninsula, we saw teens and 20s. Cottesview Sound temperatures were generally in the low to mid teens today. St. Lawrence Island, 34. A pretty uh, windy day out across that region with gusts in the order of 50 to 60 miles per hour. Southwestern parts of Alaska in the 30s and lower 40s once you got around King Salmon, a point south, 30s and 40s into the Alaska Peninsula. Sand Point was 41. Cold Bay, False Pass area was mainly in the upper 30s. St. Paul and St. George in the upper 30s today. Shemi, though, considerably colder at 28. Here's a look at temperatures overnight. It's going to be another cold one for Fort Yukon, as you would expect, with high pressure in charge of your weather situation and a clear, dry night. 42 below there. The Arctic Coast, 15 to 25 below. Seward Peninsula and areas like Nome, 27 above. Around Kivalina and Kotzebue Sound, uh, temperatures will hover in the single digits. Some places a little bit closer into the interior will probably go below zero. Uniclete about 10, McGrath 9 below, southwest and Bristol Bay area above freezing tonight. The Alaska Peninsula upper 30s and lower 40s, Kodiak 34 and lower 30s for the Aleutians, the Pribilofs 31. High temperatures tomorrow in southeast upper 20s to mid 30s. South Central upper 20s to mid 30s there. One of the warmer spots will be Seward at 37. 39 in Kodiak, southwest looking at temps above 40 degrees around Bristol Bay. Uh, a little bit cooler out around the Alaska Peninsula and parts of the eastern chain, 38 degrees around Dutch Harbor on Alaska. The central and western chain, still above freezing, but a little bit cooler, 25 around Uniclet, uh, Kotzebue and Shishmaref, teens and 20s for you. Wainwright, probably 8, 5 below in Barrow, and Kaktovik, 9 below with Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse looking at 10 below, Fairbanks, uh, 7 above. Flying weather, like I said, in the interior, things should be pretty clear. We'll have a wide swath of IFR, though, and that moisture channel hits Kodiak Island, the Alaska Peninsula, and then again over the uh, YK Delta up to St. Lawrence Island, mainly west of the Bering Strait, though. And anything over southeast and Prince William Sound looks to be relatively clear. So here's your past conditions, just in case. VFR conditions for Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass tomorrow. Also for the uh, Alaska Range, Lake Clark and Merrill Pass expected to be VFR. Rainy Pass should be fine. As you get up toward Windy Pass, we expect VFR conditions there. And for Isabel Pass, visual flying. Mentasta Pass expected to be VFR throughout your Sunday. Tanita Pass should be VFR. And what do you know, Portage Pass should be VFR tomorrow. Breezy, choppy around Chilkoot and White Pass, but also VFR in southeast. Here's a look at freezing levels now. The surface freezing line, as you would expect, taking a pretty hard jog northward with that southerly flow across southwest and the west coast. So we see that all the way north of the St. Matthew Island waters over Nunavak Island and the YK Delta, Kodiak Island, and then hugging the Gulf Coast. And then at elevated levels, two to 4,000, even 6,000 foot freezing lines showing up here on the lower Yukon Valley though. So pretty substantial warming and that's the reason we're getting clear ice across the west coast and the Seward Peninsula. So anywhere above 4,000, below 18,000 feet we were detecting icing today. And again, that's gonna be the threat zone tomorrow. Not to mention the freezing rain potential at the surface. So watch for that if you have flying plans out around Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, Kotzebue Sound area, or into the Brooks Range. Now, if you're in the interior, it uh, doesn't look like there's any major threat for icing tomorrow around the Bristol Bay area, below 10,000, but above 3,000 feet, you could run into occasional rime, uh, some of that reaching occasional moderate status there. So just be on your guard for icing potential on the West Coast. The reason this is happening is that upside down U-shaped pattern, uh, the kind of a, a blocking pattern with high pressure sitting up across the Yukon Valley and uh, parts of the eastern interior. As that sits in place or even is cuts off from the main flow of the jet stream here, it could be here to stay for a couple days at least. So at 9,000 feet, you see a similar pattern. It's a little more displaced to the north and east. The strongest winds working right over the west coast in the Bering Strait between 60 and 70 knots. A uh, light southwesterly flow coming up to the Panhandle and then becoming more southeasterly with time, uh, rolling over the northern gulf between 30 and 50 knots. At 3,000 feet, uh, high pressure is a little bit further eastward. We've got more of a broad southeasterly flow coming off of the Panhandle between 15 and 40 knots. And then speeds really pick up again across the YK Delta and through the Bering Strait up to 50 to even 70 knots. Turbulence potential, you better believe it, across the YK Delta above 4,000 and below 18,000 feet again. If those levels sound familiar, they should be from the icing levels. Below 4,000 feet across parts of the interior, watch for uh, some uh, strong Chinook winds perhaps across the Alaska Range. We'll see if that develops tomorrow. And across South Central and Kodiak Island, uh, below four to 6,000 feet, and mainly across southern parts of Southeast as well. Low level wind shear and gap winds are going to be an issue in many areas across the Panhandle. As a look at your aviation forecast, we'll be back with your marine weather here in just a few minutes.
Now, once we've determined the where and the when and the who and the wind, we'll want to know what kind of weather we're looking at. And looking is the operative word because the next field we're going to be talking about is the visibility. So visibility is reported in statute miles and fractions. And there are some neat formatting features here that are really going to be helpful. First of all, when the visibility is reported in miles and fractions, there's a space between the whole number and the fraction. And that makes the presentation a whole lot clearer. Also, the letter group SM here is included to remind us that the visibility is reported in statute miles. And that also makes the visibility group easier to identify. So if you're looking for the visibility and you don't know where it is, look for that SM. It'll tell you that you can see miles and it's actually statute miles. But it helps remind you that that's the visibility segment of the report. Now, visibility in the METAR report looks like this. This reads one and one half mile visibility. Notice the statute miles. Notice we have that space there. Very helpful. Now, in addition to the visibility report, we can also get runway visual range. Now, runway visual range looks like this. It's an actual instrument, uh, and it reads the visibility along a specified runway. It's arrived at by shining a calibrated light. You can see this calibrated light going here from a tower along the runway to a receiver, which is about 250 to 500 feet away. Now, the intensity of the light that is received is converted into an RVR value, and that gives pilots a direct indication of visibility in feet on a specific runway in low visibility conditions. Now, let's take a look at the METAR report. You can see an R tells you that this is an RVR report for runway 17 left, and you can see that the runway follows right after that R. It's 17 left, and it's 2,600 feet. And FT tells you that's feet, and the abbreviation FT reminds us that this is RVR, and it's reported in feet. So it all comes out looking just like that. By the way, RVRs lower or higher than the lowest or highest reportable values will have either an M or a P as the first character of the value field to indicate a value less than the minimum reportable value or more than the minimum reportable value. Let's take a look at what we're talking about here. Here we have RVR for runway 32L left is M 600 feet, and that means less than 600 feet. That M means minus, and in this field it means less than the reportable value. So this is a good time, by the way, for me to point out that the letter M used by itself in a METAR report always means minus or less than. It does not mean missing, because missing parameters in the METAR report really are missing. There's just nothing there at all. So let's talk about the weather. I love to talk about the weather. And for our purposes, weather is actually the stuff which is blowing around in or falling out of the sky. It's not clouds. That's sky condition. Weather is stuff like this, rain and fog. And let's take a look at the coding for the types of precipitation you'll find in a METAR. There are nine types of precipitation in a METAR, and unfortunately, you're going to have to learn the new code for this. Now, I know it seems just as soon as you learn the code, the FAA changes it. I know it frustrates me, and my decoder ring has been out of service for years now. But don't worry. You will not need your decoder ring because most of these things are going to be pretty easy to remember, and we're going to make the rest real easy to remember with a few little tricks. Let's take a look at them. First of all, RA, that's easy. That stands for rain. DZ is drizzle, not dizzy. That's drizzle. SN is snow. PE is ice pellets. SG is snow grains. So far, so good, folks. IC is ice crystals. UP is unknown precipitation. Now, why in the world would you ever have unknown precipitation? Because you have an automated station that can't tell the difference. That's why. How about GR? Hail greater than a quarter inch? Sure, that's going to be easy to remember, isn't it? Well, this is not derived from English. It's an abbreviation for the French word grêle, and that means hail. Now, you're going to have trouble remembering that because I would have trouble remembering that. Any person who speaks English is going to have trouble remembering that. So think of as GR is standing for granite rain. Because if you happen to be flying in conditions like this where there's hail, it's going to sound like granite anyway, so that's granite rain. We got another one. GS is small hail or snow pellets. Now, how are we going to remember that? Well, that's the French word, grésil. And that stands for or means small hail. That's still hail. It's just a smaller variety. So you can think of this as granite 
small variety. C, nothing to it. Let's talk about obstructions of visibility, otherwise known as obscurations. Do you think that this qualifies as an obscuration? You bet it does. Eventually there will be ground down there, even an airport coming along, but this definitely qualifies as an obscuration. Well, there are eight types of obstructions to visibility that may be reported. Let's take a look at them. First of all, FG stands for fog. That's visibility one half mile or less. BR stands for mist. That's really visibility with fog uh, more than a half mile. Now, wait a minute. Why is there a distinction between really two types of fog? Well, it comes from the British, and we're talking about the famous London fog. We're not talking about an overcoat here. We're talking about the weather. Now, what it is, it seems the British don't think you have fog unless you can cut it with a knife. So they established a new name for what is known as wimpy fog or mist, and that's BR. Now, how do you remember these? Well, FG fog is pretty easy. There's nothing to that. But once again, you might suspect that BR comes from something other than English. Well, it does. It comes from the French word brume. There you go, BR. Now, how are you going to remember this? Is that going to be easy for someone that speaks English? No, I tell you it's not. So here's the way that we're going to remember this. Think of BR or mist being little teeny tiny droplets of baby rain. And so BR will stand for baby rain. Of course, it's not falling through the air. It's actually suspended. It's little teeny tiny droplets. It's fog droplets with visibility more than a half mile. But remember, BR stands for baby rain, and that'll help you remember that's mist. Now let's take a look at another one. FU stands for smoke. Once again, that doesn't look English, so it comes from the French word fumé. And you can remember that with the English word fumes, because FU is fumes, that's smoke. That's easy. All right, HZ is haze, PY is spray. You can see it in the word spray there, PY. How are you going to remember that? Well, if you try and pronounce the letters PY uh, real close together, you'll probably spray and you'll create some spray there. So PY is spray. SA is sand, DU is dust, and VA is volcanic ash. So here we have it. That's what we need to remember. And more on learning METAR code here coming up again tomorrow. Here's a look at Sunday's marine forecast across southeast. There will be higher gusts and gap wind issues as we go through Sunday and again on Monday, but certainly on Sunday. Northerly is coming down the Lynn Canal through uh, Stevens Passage there between 25 and 30 knots. Stronger gusts in some cases could reach up to 50 not so be careful with that. Easterly is coming across the southern entrances and offshore up and down the coast. Easterly winds anywhere from 25 to 30 knots with seas running between 9 and 10 feet. By Monday the winds are subsiding somewhat. Still got a northerly wind though in the Lynn Canal and that means stronger gusts through a lot of the gap areas. 20 to 25 knots sustained from the northeast across the middle and southern areas between 4 and 5 foot seas are expected. 6 foot seas in the Lynn Canal and we'll keep those easterly offshore flow uh, going from Yakutat all the way down to the Dixon entrance, uh, 15 to 25 knots with 8-foot seas expected there on Monday. For South Central, a northeasterly broad flow working through the Cook Inlet across Prince William Sound and the Western Gulf. And then you get into the Barren Islands, and you're going to see some stronger gusts in that region. And some areas could see winds upwards of 60 knots. So, uh, again, be careful in this region. 28-foot seas are expected across the uh, areas east of the Barren Islands. 45-knot winds sustained coming into Kodiak with higher gusts. 24-foot seas are expected there on Sunday. You can see the winds diminish again across across all areas on Monday, and we're still holding on to that similar pattern, more of an easterly flow crossing the Gulf, northeasterly is inside Prince William Sound, and down uh, the Cook Inlet, 15 to 25 knots. You'll notice we've got our sea forecast there again at three feet across the northern Cook Inlet, and easterly is inside Shelikov Strait with 11 foot seas expected there on Monday. Across the Alaska Peninsula tomorrow, a southerly flow north of Cold Bay at 15 knots. Easterlies uh, coming across the Bristol Bay region. Pretty strong winds there. Storm warnings there tonight, in fact. And southeasterlies, uh, south and east of Chignik with a 12-foot sea. Southwesterly, south of King Cove and Sand Point. Now, as we get into Monday, the wind flow shifts a little bit more. You can see low pressures working its way back into the Bering Sea. Easterlies through Bristol Bay, northeasterlies north of the peninsula, and southeasterlies coming across the Pacific Ocean between 15 and 25 knots. 10 to 14 foot seas are expected on Monday with fewer gusts. A west and southwesterly flow across the chain. Some of the stronger winds out there across the western parts of the chain itself at 35 knots. 17 foot seas there. And 20 to 25 knot winds across the Bering Sea side. About the same on the Pacific side with 12 to 13 foot seas there on the north side. 6 to 11 foot seas are expected Sunday. A little bit of a shift on Monday. In fact, winds become light and variable around Nikolsky and Unalaska. 
On the Pacific side, we're still dealing with 20 knot winds, uh, mainly from the east across the eastern part of the chain. A little bit of a, a change here as the frontal boundary is working across. And then across the west, a south and westerly flow at 20 knots with 9 foot seas from Kiska out toward Attu on Monday. Across the west coast, you can use some of your various METAR precipitation codes here as the precipitation types may be changing close to the coast. Rain, snow, and freezing rain possible in many areas. And the winds will be on top of you as well. If you're around Nunavak Island, 45 to 50 knot winds. And again, the storm force winds here tonight. Those should subside as we get into the daytime tomorrow. 10 foot seas are expected. Uh, as we get into uh, the Pribilofs, 20 knot winds from the south and east with a 7 foot sea and 40 knot winds over the St. Matthew Island waters and much better conditions as we head into Monday. An east and southeasterly wind will prevail, but winds subside to about 20 to 25 knots, especially around St. Lawrence Island. So blizzard conditions should lessen somewhat as we get into uh, the beginning of the week. Broad easterly flow sweeping across the Arctic coast between 20 and 25 knots will continue. And look for offshore winds around Kotzebue Sound at 30 knots. That shifts to more of a southeasterly flow on Monday and diminishes to 25 knots, 15 knots there west of Wainwright and blowing from the east across Kaktovik, Dead Horse and uh, Prudhoe Bay as we get into Monday. Here's a recap of what's going on around your part of Alaska tonight. A broad frontal boundary will work uh, and stall very close to the south and west coast. Trapping precipitation across the west coast, meaning rain and freezing rain and blizzard conditions will all be possible across especially the Seward Peninsula, Kotzebue Sound at St. Lawrence Island and parts of the YK Delta. Most of the interior and southeast are going to be clear. Maybe some winds and stronger gusts across southeast. Snow is possible north of the Aleutians and mainly north of Shemya out across the western bearing. A sloppy day across the west coast with wind, blizzard conditions, freezing rain across many areas there. Make sure you check the very latest watches and warnings with NOAA Weather Radio or weather.gov slash Alaska. As we get into Monday, conditions start to ease up across the west coast. Precipitation continues to focus on Kodiak. Have a good night. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.